That's a weapon. Yeah. All right, firing. Light them all up. Come on, fire. Keep shooting. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me onto the conference today for this tribunal. It's uh, an honor to be invited to it. And I want to say thank you to all of the people that have already spoken about this, the way in which uh, Jennifer has described the 10 year battle that she and others have fought to try to protect Julian Assange and the way that Rafael Correa has uh, paid such a very heavy price for the very bold decision he took as president of Ecuador. And it's been an absolute pleasure to meet him during my one of my visits to Brussels last year. Some time ago, I asked the British Prime Minister what the situation was with Julian Assange during Prime Minister's question time. And he gave actually a very interesting and slightly surprising answer because he confessed to me in Parliament, so therefore it doesn't get more public than that, that the extradition arrangements between Britain and the United States were lopsided, to put it mildly, in that the US can take somebody back to the United States who is accused of killing a British national in a um, incident outside an airbase in Britain and uh, applications to the USA for that person to be brought back to Britain to face trial and uh, for the charge that's been put, brought against them by the police and the Crown Prosecution Service. And the US simply refuses on the basis it doesn't have to do so because the extradition arrangements are so lopsided. The Prime Minister accepted they're lopsided. And so I think one should just reflect on that for a moment, that uh, the idea that uh, Julian Assange should be extradited to the USA when there are no equivalent arrangements the other way around needs to be thought about very, very seriously. On behalf of um, my team in March of this year, I asked uh, John McDonnell, then our Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer and very much a leading figure in our Shadow Cabinet at that time to visit Julian Assange in prison. He did. He was shocked and appalled by the conditions shocked and appalled by the condition that uh, Julian had been forced into by his lengthy incarceration and shocked by the conditions in Belmarsh. And having visited Belmarsh once in the past, it is not a nice place at all. It is a very, very brutal prison indeed. And so we then go through what Julian will face if extradited to the USA and what he's suffered so far. It's very clear from all that's been said in the court that um, if he goes to the United States, um, he will be put in a federal penitentiary under the most brutal conditions, 23 hours a day at least in solitary confinement, limited contact with anybody else, limited phone calls, limited reading material, and indeed it will be a perpetual punishment for him um, uh, in the most awful conditions imaginable. Indeed, they've even identified the prison that he would be sent to. And if that happens, then what has been the role of the British government and the British judicial system in this? And that has to be looked at. Now, Julian already has suffered because he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy granted by President Correa. He was granted refugee status by the government of uh, Ecuador, but unable to leave the embassy in Britain. And it then turns out that uh, the people who were supposedly the security guards were in fact working for uh, those that were opposed to Julian and making the situation much worse for him. What's also been strange has been the very limited reporting in the British media of the trial, because this is a massive trial by any stretch of the imagination. You have to go back a very long way to Sun Yat-sen's time to find a prominent um, foreign national taking refuge in an embassy in London in order to um, prevent themselves being deported somewhere else where their future would be, to put it mildly, uncertain. And then you have to look 
at what Julian is accused of. And I think the point that Rafael Correa made about the information he released and the point that Jennifer made about the responsibility with which he released that information to prevent any individual being put in a place of danger as a result of WikiLeaks. I think that is a very strong and very important point. But what were the truths that WikiLeaks exposed? It's the truths about Iraq, the truths about um, Guantanamo Bay, the truths about extraordinary rendition, the truths about the abuse of human rights at the one place in the world where there is no concept whatsoever of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights having any applicability, and that is Guantanamo Bay. And I have taken up the cases of a number of um, people, British nationals and others, who've been in Guantanamo Bay, and indeed was part of a delegation to the US Senate to plead for the release of a number of people from there. But we should also reflect that the media that made so much of the news story of the WikiLeaks publication, the exposure of Iraq, of Afghanistan, of Guantanamo Bay, and of so many other things around the world. And indeed, the spying on Angela Merkel, the spying on other leading political figures, the spying on people who didn't know they were being spied on. Many of us are accustomed to that, um, that particular process. Made a great deal about that and pretended they had these great scoops. Where are they now in defending a journalist, a journalist who has exposed the truth about what is going on around the world. And so I don't know what the outcome of this particular process is going to be when the judgment is handed down in February of next year. All I do know is that whatever the result then, as Jennifer has already explained, um, it's not going to be without an appeal by either side. It will then go through another process of appeal, and that will probably end up in the Supreme Court in Britain. And after that, I would imagine it will go to the European Court of Human Rights. And the British government is still, we understand, um, committed to maintaining membership of the European Court of Human Rights and adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights, which are not EU um, institutions, they're Council of Europe institutions. And I've recently become a member of the Council of Europe. So I will obviously be watching that very, very closely. But if uh, all those cases are lost and somewhere along the line, a decision is made, by the relevant interior minister in Britain, the Home Secretary, to deport Julian Assange to the USA, then another process will no doubt begin in American courts. So we're looking at somebody who has been badly treated, suffered appallingly in prison and in, in incarceration effectively in the um, Ecuadorian embassy, then going through years of legal wrangling whilst in high security prisons in the United States. Is there a way around all this? Yes, there is. There is for the British government to simply say that they do not believe it would be legally just or proper, would be within the terms of the Universal Convention on Human Rights on the, and the European Convention on Human Rights for Julian Assange to be deported to a place where he would, as we well know, suffer the torture of the um, incarceration system within the United States. It's within their hands to do it. When you showed the video earlier of Tarek speaking at the Russell Tribunal about Vietnam, he explained what happened in Vietnam, what napalm did to people, what My Lai the My Lai massacre was really about. Mm -hmm. That information crept out and it turned public opinion about the war in Vietnam because that was a pre-internet age, a pre-social media age. We relied on first -hand, limited first-hand accounts to know what was going on in Vietnam. I was part of the campaign against the Vietnam War. We now know much more around the world. We now have much more information. 
what we've been told is what the brutality of war is, what happens when you invade Iraq. You can wave a flag. You can lift yourself up to some patriotic fervor about the need to go to war in Iraq. But at the end of it, children die. Homes are destroyed. Schools are destroyed. Hospitals are destroyed. People's lives are destroyed. And then, years later, they show up as refugees trying to get across the Mediterranean on the English Channel to get to a place of safety because of the way their lives were destroyed by wars promoted by Western interests. I'm pleased we're having this tribunal today, and I'm pleased at the way in which people are at last beginning to understand. If we want to live in a safe and secure world, you'll respect human rights everywhere for everybody all over the world.